You're watching Nerdosity. What's up, Nerdosity? This is your host, Tiger Eye Cosplay, coming at you. And today, I'm doing another top list of Nerdosity. But this time, it is the top 10 scariest and evil Pixar villains. You know, Pixar just hits different than regular Disney a good bit of the time, and these villains are no different. They're literally, they do, they, they just hit different, they do. Not only are these villains a lot of the time rooted in reality, like this could actually happen, like these, these villains, they're real, they're grounded, but they also take the root of murder and torture almost like all the time. It's, it's weird. Pixar, are you okay? Yeah, but uh, these are my top 10 worst offenders. Please enjoy, and obviously beware spoilers for Pixar movies. Let's get into it. So the first on our list, number 10, is Stinky Pete from Toy Story 2. It's a little hard to view animal or toy villains from a lot of movies as being super scary because you just can't quite relate, you know? They're not human. But Pixar does a fantastic job of making the conflicts relatable and the characters so human enough that you just can't help but relate and 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 and, and the characters attach to you so quickly you get you get so attached you feel for woody and the gang when he gets stolen but you also feel for andy as well because he didn't make this choice he didn't ask to get to for woody to be in the yard sale he was off on vacation and then he's gonna come home and see that his favorite toy is gone Poor kid, seriously. So when Stinky Pete was more than happy to manipulate and brainwash the other toys of Woody's roundup, and then turn around to physically uh, hurting Woody, you know, tearing his arm almost clean off again, just to keep them from escaping the airport, wow, it just hit different. And you were extremely satisfied to imagine his subsequent torture by getting caught by that little girl, you know, with the clown Barbie, with her whole face just, messed up, you knew Stinky Pete was going to get the Cynthia from Rugrats treatment. Booyah! Alright guys, number 9 is Water Noose from Monsters, Inc. This guy was like a super creepy crab centaur monster that was like super scary in of itself because he was just like really weird and creepy looking, but he was also a scary boomer that wanted to keep all the monsters in the dark ages of scaring children for power instead of embracing the future of laughter because he just couldn't get past his weird phobia of the weakest human of them all, children. Yeah. He was ready to kill Boo, like kill this, what, three-year-old child? fully just murder her and also basically kill Sully and Mike by banishing them to a snow blizzard wasteland. Good thing the abominable snowman was there, right? Randall was definitely a good contender for this movie in this uh, little spot, number nine, but he was only a lackey to the big man, the big guns, and that was water news for sure, yeah. Now, number eight is the mind, or you specifically, from Inside Out. It rocked me to my core when I saw a very concrete and grounded and like so visceral and real representation of losing your emotions, just emotions in general, and falling into depression or, or like a, a sense of euphoria or, or deep sadness and, and just how the mind works and only being saved by allowing yourself to feel all of the emotions completely in certain ways. You just have to be able to be in tune with your emotions. And, and let me tell you, that is real stuff. That is real stuff. Just just imagine seeing a serial killer's mind on screen or, or, or someone who wanted to just end the job to themselves. Like that's, that's, wow, that's just a lot. The implications are so intense. And I know that this might not be a classic villain because it's not tangible. It's not real like that. Like you can't touch it. But the mind can really root against you in the worst way possible. And it's just freaky. All right, number seven is Chef Skinner from Ratatouille. You know, he's probably the least powerful or influential uh, villain on our list, but honestly, his movie was the most realistic and grounded in terms of conflict, story, where they're at, and resolution. I mean, it's a restaurant in France. Those things are real. It's five-star restaurants. Those things are real. This was a real thing. Food critics, real. Now, yes, I know that a rat can cook, and that's 
and, and then the moving of the hair and stuff can make a puppet or a marionette out of Linguini, but let's just move past that. Chef Skinner was a very terrible boss to his employees and the brand and just had an awful work environment, let's be honest. And he was willing to sell out Gusto the moment the man drew his last breath. Like he wasn't even cold yet. And the dude was selling frozen burritos at Walmart. Let him, let him, let him go in the ground first, my dude. Not only does he not care about the opinions or feelings of his workers, and he breeds a fearful and tense work environment. Like I said, not a good work environment at all. But he's willing to lie to Linguini and keep the fact that he is Gusto's son just so he, he wouldn't have to hand over the restaurant. He's, he willfully makes Linguini become drunk. Like, I feel like that's just a crime in of itself. Like, to make somebody drunk on purpose just to get information out of them? Mm, that's wild. It's like drugging somebody, but you can't show that on, on a kid's movie. He puts Linguini in positions of failure just to have an excuse to get rid of them when they fail. And then he later sabotages the restaurant by calling the health inspector to come bust the fact that there are rats in the restaurant. And then also kidnapping Remy. Which is also like a count of blackmail and kidnapping and imprisonment, you know? Like, that's just a whole list of crimes. And yeah, and he blackmailed Remy by using his life. So he was really willing to kill this rat if he didn't make his own uh, line of frozen foods. Yeah, which, which is a lot. No, Skinner was, was willing to do anything to protect his bottom line, and that's just deplorable. Not to mention crappy bosses like this just hit too close to home, because this is just is really real, like I said, really real. All right, number six is Mordu from Brave. Brave was a Pixar outlier and the fact that it was a princess movie, and she's technically also a Disney princess. I know Pixar is technically Disney now, but it wasn't. I don't know if it was Disney at the time, if, if Disney had bought out Pix Pixar at the time, but I know that Ratatouille and, and above was definitely Pixar only, you know? So Pixar is different, okay guys? It's different. What isn't an outlying feature though is the way that the story flows and the crazy freaky villain, crazy awful villain. Starting off as an arrogant and ruthless human prince, Mordu drank a potion that was meant to change his fate and instead he was twisted and changed into a large, powerful, and murderous bear. Using this newfound strength, he went into a rampage and killed his brothers in cold blood before eventually killing the rest of his family and then terrorizing Scotland for years. The rage and letting himself be twisted and taken over by the temptations and urges, you know, letting the obtrusive thoughts win, which turned him into an irredeemable monster. The bear itself, when he came onto the screen of the movie, was just terrifying. Just terrifying in general, and it kept you on the edge of your seat the entire time. But the story of the downfall and change was the worst of it all. To see someone start off commendable and strong and proud, just to then be turned into a monstrous beast because of greed and arrogance, and again, pride, was just a lot to swallow. But at least he was free once he was taken by the jaws of death. It almost seemed like Pride and Arrogance was the real villain of it all, considering Merida was very close to falling into the same trap that Mordu did. Oh, hi, I'm sorry, are you looking at my custom-made thermos? Yeah, no, I drew this, sublimated it onto an awesome thermos, and now I get to drink something out of something that looks awesome. Right now, that something is water. Actually, it's always been water. Water is, water is bay. But you can get this, things like this, and other things like 3D printed props or items from my Etsy, Nerdosity Creations. So make sure you check it out. And let's get into number five. All right, party people, halfway. Number five is Screen Slaver from Incredibles 2. Even though Evelyn Dever is incredibly normal comparatively to the rest of the cast of this movie, I mean normal in, in, in the terms of superpowers, not mental fortitude, yeah, yeah. She is a very formidable and scary villain because of her ideals and tactics to bring about her new world order. It almost reads like Hitler to a point. I mean, to be honest. I mean, she believes that all supers should be killed off or detained or just 
non-existent anymore because they make society as a whole lazy, like I said, because they depend on them too much. She comes to this conclusion when her father was killed by burglars while hoping a hero would come and save him. And then their mother died shortly thereafter due to heartbreak. Seeing supers as a threat, she bides her time by honing her craft of inventions and her immense intellect so that she could invent something that would finally put into play the plan that will permanently damage the super's reputation in the public's eyes so that uh, her new world order can become the norm using the incredible family as a catalyst. She was fully ready to use any means to enact this plan, from mind control all the way to murder. Like I said, murder is a big thing with these characters. Big thing with all of these villains. She put innocent lives in danger during the subway takeover and the yacht incident, not to mention putting an innocent man in jail as a patsy for her crimes. The worst part, though, comes with her mind control invention. When she took away people's control over their body and their mind just to cause them to do her b dirty work, it's awful. I mean, to have that knowledge on your conscience that you hurt somebody or maybe even killed somebody or just let something happen that you could have prevent, even if you weren't in your right mind, is probably one of the worst things that you could go through or have to live with for the rest of your life. And it's just freaky to think about that she would willingly do this to people. It's one thing to actually believe what you're doing is right and to do it on your own accord, but to have someone else do it through you? Ooh. Not to mention, she fully tortured Elastigirl and then tried to kill her through asphyxiation. That's a rough way to go. Uh, yeah, it's just freaky to think about how someone's mind and ideals can be so twisted by a turn of events. It's such a real life reaction as well. I mean, sociopaths and psychopaths kind of go through that with not so good home lives. All right, number four is Charles Muntz from Up. Again, more arrogance and desperation on this list and it comes in the form of a childhood hero and a very supposedly dead old man. He's like Screenslaver in the way that he seemed like a good guy in the beginning and the fact that his ideals turned sour, but then he becomes a worse villain when you realize how far he's willing to go just to become famous and show up the people who uh, disbelieved him. I mean, Screenslaver, Evelyn was doing it because she thought that this was correct. Like she believed that the world was getting lazy and that they needed a change. He's just doing it for fame and fortune. He's willing to kill Carl, an old man, and Russell, a literal child, just so that they don't rat him out. And he's also willing to poach animals just to prove he was right about them. It's the animal cruelty for me that bumps him up to number four. And the fact that he brainwashes and controls all those dogs to be useless fodder to throw at his enemies just so that he can prevail. I'm sure a lot of those dogs died and I'm upset about that. It's just awful, awful to see how greed can cause a once good man to turn horribly evil. All right, number three is Otto from Wally. -E. I know that this robot was just following orders from the higher ups that like programmed him this way from hundreds of years ago, theoretically. But considering how many robots in this movie managed to change their programs internally and then see the light and do things that were not a part of what they were originally created to do, things that were deeply ingrained it's clear Otto was keeping those people fat and roaming around space for his own benefit, okay? I mean, he was he was the big dude, the ruler of all the robots or whatever. He could have changed if he wanted to. Even though they finally had signs of life on Earth again, that it was viable for humans to go back, Otto didn't want them to go back and was just keeping them in space through any means necessary. He started with just trying to detain Wally, but then it turned into destroying the poor robot, resetting Eve, and neutralizing the captain. When that didn't work, he resorted to going down with the ship and taking everyone with him, all the thousands of people and children, almost committing mass murder in the process if it wasn't for Wally at the end. Seriously, guys. A robot uprising has been a scary thing for years, and this is no different, especially since it's a kid's movie, so you viewed it as a kid, that's even more freaky, and since, since, since you gotta know, 
Like, you, you gotta believe that, that they, they have probably resorted to cannibalism since they've been in space way longer than anyone anticipated. Like, way after they were supposed to go back to Earth. Where are they getting the food? Seriously. But also the fact that the humans, the first humans, the one that did this whole charter, charter trip, were complicit in keeping everyone in the dark about never going back. All right, number two is Ernesto de la Cruz from Coco. I know that this guy also isn't so prolific as the other characters on this list in terms of villainy or acts of uh, violence that they did. But, but the thing that's different from the other ones is he actually succeeds in a whole bunch of his villainy, okay? He like actually succeed, be, succeeds. And I also think that the closeness and the way that he went about doing his crimes and how hard it hit me also really solidifies his number two spot. As a starting out musician, Ernesto joined forces with Hector be, to become famous. Realizing Hector's potential in songwriting and musicianship, he knew that it was his one shot to the top. So when Hector wanted to leave and take all of his genius with him, Ernesto couldn't let that happen. He secretly poison Hector, toasting him off to his next adventure as a friend, murdering him in the process for sure. Then he stole his diary of songs off of his person as well as his guitar so that he could steal all of the works to become the greatest musician of all time while using the very guitar that his friend once held. That's dirty. You, that's like mean girl crap. Dirty. You're just desecrating the dead here. And he didn't even tell anyone, so he just went, so Hector just went along the wayside, unmarked grave, I am sure. Seriously, guys. When Ernesto was finally figured out in the end as a fraud, the gravity of his crimes really hit hard. Not only did he kill his dearest friend, but he made movies of the acts, movies of the murder, like him toasting off and, and like drinking a poison drink before, you know, being the good guy in the end. And then he profited off of all of Hector's talent because he couldn't write a song to save his life. Okay, and then that also caused Hector's family to hate music and Hector because Hector left and never came back and they didn't know why. They thought he just abandoned his family. Plus, like I said, he also used Hector's guitar for all of this, which is just a slap in the face, let's be honest. To keep all of it a secret and to protect his reputation and fame, he was ready to kill Miguel too. Like he stranded him in a hole in the spirit realm so that he could never get out and slowly turn into a dead skeleton soul, which would also cause Hector to permanently disappear and die into nothingness uh, because nobody would remember him. Knowing all that just made him profoundly more evil and awful. But the craftiness and wickedness of it all just doesn't seem fake. Like, like somebody would actually do this, just stab you in the back. They do it all the time. Seriously, it is your truly closest friends that can do the most damage. All right, last but not least, number one is Syndrome from The Incredibles. Obviously, Syndrome was going to be number one, right? I mean, seriously, there was no, no doubt about it. No contest. He's the only Pixar character and villain that willingly and happily committed mass genocide to countless supers in this world, not mentioning the innocents that he had to kill during the robot battle and all other battles that he did, and the henchman fodder that he just threw at the supers. They die a lot. You see a lot of on-screen deaths, and it's wild, because this, this is a kid's movie. All because he was slighted, ever so slighted by his idol. Let's not get it twisted. He didn't do it for any ideal. He got, he was told by his hero, nah, I don't want you to work with me. And he went off the deep end. I mean, he knew that Mr. Incredible did not work with anyone because he was, quote unquote, his biggest fan. But he still got butt hurt when Mr. Incredible said it to his face. I work alone. Did you really think? that Mr. Incredible was going to let a child join him in situations that could definitely end in death at any turn. I mean, he's not Batman. It was like a game to Syndrome. How many bosses do I have to destroy before I can fight the big bad, AKA Mr. Incredible, and then win the game? But if I do fail, how can I turn this to my favor? How can I make this the best possible outcome? And the best out possible and the best possible outcome for him was kidnapping Mr. Incredible's 
and Mrs. Incredibles, the family's baby, to twist and manipulate his mind into becoming a villain that would then take on and possibly kill his father when he came of age. Syndrome was very, very clear on what he was going to do to that boy. Wild, am I right? He was then going to give all of the world, just random folks or whoever was the, was the person who could give him the most money, all of his weapons later on, just just to allow everyone a similar playing field to the supers. And, and you gotta know that this could only cause a small nuclear war. I mean, seriously. Or serious riots and acts of violence from people who just aren't right in the head. He just wanted to see the whole world devolve into chaos, starting with the murder of his childhood hero. And this, this movie, was targeted towards kids. All right, like I said, Pixar movies just hit different. And these movies and villains really prove it. All right, they just really prove it. Do you agree with my list or do you think I missed someone? Please comment that down below and give this video a huge thumbs up. And make sure you also subs uh, subscribe to my channel so I can continue doing more videos like this for you. Or maybe do some more Spider-Man videos hopefully soon if I get a new uh, partner to do these things with. And make sure you turn on that notification bell so you always are notified when I come out with new content like posts and stuff. Also, make sure you check out my Etsy, just like I said before, you can get some awesome props and 3D printed uh, items. Also, maybe sublima uh, sublima sublimated items like t-shirts or like my thermos. And if you want something custom made, there is a button for you. Thank you so much for watching. You've been watching Nerdosity, and I will see you next time. Bye!